Och i dessa centrum så so får jag veta att höra om EFT. EFT är uh, Insight Focus Therapy. Det här betyder att det är er ter- en terapiformer som uh, kommer från New Zealand. Och då är jag först och främst Pauline Skid som har er upprunden till EFT. Ta var i Danmark och Skåne och här har hon uh, undervisning och samskift och i fem dagar och ta säger att hända konan hon ska allt till förjär. Tog att hon var simpel hen när jag har sällt och tog sitter hon östen här i studien så hon och hon här nu. Så till er Pauline Skid så välkommen till förjär och välkommen här. Thank you. I don't know what you said but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Barrow Island. Yes. It's great to be here. Hi, I'm Pauline Skeets and I'm a psychotherapist from New Zealand. Come all the way to the Faroe Islands at the invitation of Hilda and Johannes. And um, it's great to be here and I'm here to talk about insight-focused therapy, which is my um, latest, greatest invention. Um, I, uh, just a little bit about myself, I'm uh, about... I think I'm about 53 years old, but in New Zealand you go 50, so nobody really knows how 50-ish you are, but it's 50, three. (laughs) Um, I have been married for about 33 years, so again, you say 30 years, and um, my husband is Graham, he's a lawyer, and I have three children, um, Jonathan, Anthony, and Rachel. Jonathan's 30 years old, uh, Anthony's 27, and Rachel's 24. And I know that you're going to say uh, that I look way too young to have children that old, and I think you're right. A <laughs> um, little bit about my history. Uh, I come from New Zealand, as I said. I was born and raised in Auckland. Auckland is the is not the capital of New Zealand, but it is the largest city. It's a beautiful place, and I think it's quite similar to the Faroe Islands in many ways, although we have more trees. Um, but that's not difficult to have more trees than you. Um, but it's a very beautiful place here, and uh, and the people are amazing and hospitable and kind. And I especially like the fact that um, you have a similar idea about timekeeping to me and this makes me feel very at home. Um, We call it the South Pacific Edge. Um, I'm not sure what you call it. Maybe it's the south wind that blows across the country. Um, I don't know. But anyway, I like it. Um, So I was born and raised in Auckland, New Zealand and my mother was a Salvation Army person actually she started off that way and uh, so we were raised in the Salvation Army you know and blowing the the cornet Um, and so I was raised to sing songs like stand up stand up for Jesus ye soldiers of the cross and she was really famous for singing to us day after day after day um, all of these old Salvation Army songs. And so now, as I get older, apparently your your early life comes up more and more. And so I find myself singing these songs over and over. And then I go, ooh, I must be getting old. <laughs> 50. <laughs> um, anyway, she raised me in the Salvation Army. And then in the days where they didn't have very many motor cars, they moved house and she didn't have a car and so we had to shift churches. So I've been through a selection of churches as a result and have quite a wide history, I guess, of experiences in different congregations. Um, more recently, I have been involved in um, Christian City Church, where Before that, I was involved in the Baptist church. My husband's father was a Baptist pastor of um, Hillsborough Baptist Church, Auckland, New Zealand. 
And he was still uh, one of the pastors there until he died recently at about age 83 or so. So um, so there's a, there's a long Baptist heritage there. Um, and I joined the Baptist church when I became a Christian, for, when I first became a Christian at 17. And that was a great time because the, it was during the time of the 70s and the Jesus Revolution and the um, the young people of the Baptist church there were sending people out on the streets and collecting us, uh, all of us people who needed to be saved and bringing us into the church. And they had such a great youth program um, that I decided to go and slowly work my way from the steps to the doorway to inside the doorway and then into the church itself until finally I decided that this was the place for me. And then I stayed there for mm, probably about 15 years, I guess. And we had our um, first, we had our three children there. And then finally I decided that um, it was time for me to move on. And so I went to a, another church called Christian City Church. It's a non-denominational church. Um, I don't know if you have those here, but perhaps you do. Um, anyway, Christian City Church was a church, a, a church with a different flavour, and it was started by an Australian. Originally, well, no, actually, he was originally a New Zealander who moved to Australia, and he had a special uh, emphasis on um, people who, uh, on young people who were. Uh, involved in the surfing culture. And I don't know if you know terribly much about Australia, but it's very much uh, a surfing and um, outback country. And you either, uh, well, there's a number of different things, but anyway, it's a large surfing culture. And and so the emphasis was on, on youth. And I decided that I wanted to be involved in this because, um, amongst other things, my children were growing up, and they were needed to be involved in, uh, in the culture um, that they were going to be attracted by, and I wanted to sort of try and join these two things together, the thing that they wanted to do and the belief system that I wanted them to have. So I joined the church, um, and after a number of years I decided that um, I would become, uh, I was asked actually to become one of the pastors of the church, and so I did that, um, and was a pastor at Christian City Church for several years, and specifically I was involved in organising the, the counselling department, um, which was uh, something that I had always thought of being involved in um, historically, but had never really got round to doing. Prior to starting um, at Christian City Church, I was I trained as a nurse and had done some psychiatric nursing as well, but had never really uh, dived into the counselling culture until I arrived at Christian City Church. And then it was all in, and I was organising a large team of people, and we all of us realised that we actually needed to be far better trained and then we were, and we needed more than just a heart to help people, we needed actually some skills. And so it was around about that time that I decided to go back to university and to continue studying. And so I went and um, did a degree in counselling and counselling studies. And over a period of time, uh, what happened was that we realised that the secular counselling um, methods that we learnt uh, in university, were they were great, but they didn't really account for the um, the religious beliefs or the spiritual beliefs of the of the people that we were trying to work with, and so we uh, realised um, at a certain point that we needed to find something that was far more um, integrative and useful within the church culture. So it was around about that time that uh, a friend of mine and I um, began, amongst other people, began to put together some ideas about an integrated form of counselling that included spirituality and 
um, psychological principles about what it meant to be human. And um, a very long story, which I'm sure you don't really want to hear, um, brings us to this day where we have uh, what we call insight-focused therapy. And insight-focused therapy is, uh, is specifically an integrated form of therapy or it's a form of people helping that is designed to incorporate um, the best of what it is that the psychological world has to offer us and incorporating it in with the, um, the theological and spiritual aspects of what it is to be a spiritually awakened person. And insight focused therapy is, it is a therapy, but it can also be used as a personal developmental tool um, so that you can just take it in and, and uh, to help yourself grow um, in your own room at home. Or you can um, help your children and your family come to better understanding about who you are and where you are and why you are the way you are. Uh, and it can also be used in a therapeutic setting. Um, and as a counsellor in New Zealand, I have my own practice in Auckland, New Zealand, and have done so for the last 12 to 15 years. And there uh, we see all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life, and um, sometimes Christian, sometimes non-Christian, but when um, Christians come for counselling, it, it's very important for them to be able to incorporate their spirituality into their counselling or into their um, changing, changing their mindset. And so insight-focused therapy has been a really useful tool for us um, to achieve that. And there are some real special features about insight-focused therapy that make it more than just a, a therapeutic tool. Um, and I guess we'll talk about some of those shortly. Insight-focused therapy, kvitea. Vi ska se när kommer att titta att jag har också nu arbetat i Afrika i några år och mot inte var här att jag var här ute att få mera vitan om terapi och om sala rökt så att jag står i en arbete just när det var vi äts patienten och också nu vi vi sexuellen, fallet vi sexuellen och agenter. Och det var också väldigt viktigt för mig att få mera vitan om det. Så jag var så heldig att ha 25 så att jag får underkämpla utbyggningarna som var i förrgen. Och kom så att arbeta som terapeuter i några år. Men när jag mötte, uh, mötte Pauline så kom jag ordentligt att, att sucka att hända den här holistiska. Det vill säga att det här är så all lika med andra. Det var det här hejde Pauline uh, lukar som integrerar i sina twin terapeutiska rättning som heter EFT. Och jag har ju upplevning av att det manglar i mina utbildning till Kempler. Och det är nämligen så att få vid att människa in i terapirummet att låta till svala rökt. Och det är människa som sitter i fyra och en psykolog som inte är hävd att anta det. Han kan saktans hjälpa honom, men jag följde onkligt i att tann passerna mer at det ikke har vært han åpenløgge for to i parsene mer. Og to tenkte jeg også, men hvis jeg skal hjelpe mennesker som er den andelige parsene, hvis det var en tøtning, så kunne jeg også være en parsene, og to ville vi til å hjelpe og ta med mennesker. Og to tenkte jeg, bøyne av veien, eller fikk løgge som som tæ, tæ, vi kan godt kalle det kalt, men da har man gått i tjenesten at si en nærke som er kalt. Fikk et brennende innskjø av kalt om at at lære mer i IFT. Så jeg røste til Danmark i en lenge tid. Jeg lurte etter Pauline, det som hun heier. Og så kom hun til Førje i Østen. Jeg ville til Østen bære det frem i Førje. Og bære til terapeuter, psykologer og så til samkommer og kyrkjener i Førje. Og det her er faktisk etnast utrolig vel. Så jeg lukker det nå å ha en en hundrad trusfask hårt på lin och vi är skojning på lin och i löten har vi den utbyggning av vi är röja och här har vi varit om några tjugo faktiskt utbyggningarna och det är fem moduler i allt och det är över två och ett halvt år 
tvej modulli për umare oj trucha dejer. Mos mëta se vet oj inmitlen oj lampa kër e vit ha u filtrant të skoj rrësn. O at se shkoj në të erë enskon o o të i vraskante at sutjak u hoira at floirësum hat verbenti fyrt enska at e vishkëli an sumësia o efektuaj skoj u IFT o ojsn i enskon u i visste që do të skot enks so të e ver orta gott. Men të som i halte er të bästa vi IFT të er të er të her a vi for live til at Ja, verkligen att att komma achtet till rötnar. Vi får lova till att vara tävit ära och att det som är öst gott, det är det vi kommer från nekmon imskon, bäst samkommon och till öst nek, alltså nek imska bräck bakgrund och till öst nu jag tar kunna till lugga som att finna ett nek större förståelse för kvinnor. Och det är en verkligen en gåva vill jag säga till oss kunna för. Och det är som vi skulle höra mer om att IFT är för något att det är till IFT och han även säger att IFT är en lustdel och det är han lustdelen som gör att vi männast och vi männast börjar ut i likamliga och antaliga och sådana och vi kunde inte köra de tre tingena kvar så annars så blir vi splittade upp. Och det här som vi gör nu är att integrera och att vi gör också till hela personer. Och det är det som IFT verkligen är ett gott anbud till. Så det här vill jag anbefala. Jag ska höra på din mor. So I want to describe a little bit about what IFT is. And um, as I've said before, IFT stands for Insight Focused Therapy. And the name itself is um, an indication to some extent about what it's about. And that is that it's a focus on insight. Insight or insightfulness uh, or uh, another word for that could be awareness. So to become aware of things that you are currently unaware of. Um, and it is uh, the hope that through this awareness um, that we can bring about change. And so insight focused therapy is an important label for, for us because it is, as I said, an indicator of where we're going. It's a... It's a um, a therapy that uh, that is integrated, which means that I've taken various different ideas from various different theorists around the place and put them together and fashioned them in a certain way to and and um, incorporated them into a process um, that then gives us what we call insight focused therapy. So it's important, I think, to understand what these principles are. And if you want to find out in depth, uh, you, you would need to come to a seminar because it's quite, quite a complicated and in-depth um, look into these uh, concepts that we're talking about. But simplistically, it is uh, the notion that uh, comes from a constructive, construct, constructivist perspective that people's mental, people's mental states are constructed socially over a period of time and that their view of reality is, is not necessarily reality, but it's their perception of reality, and that is constructed in a social setting. So people construct a view of reality that, for example, um, um, could produce fear or could produce um, um, a, a view of the world where they uh, feel totally incapable of being able to do anything. And this is not necessarily the truth about them, but it is their perception of themselves based on the story that they've been given as a young child. And we take this uh, idea of a perceived view of the world and, we, and we, um, we accept it, that this is the perception that a person has. And we also know that it's not necessarily the truth. Um, it is their truth, it's their reality. Um, but it's important that we understand that their reality is their perception. And the other important factor about perception is that 
when people perceive that things are true, then it is as if they are true. So it is their reality, even if it's not necessarily a reality. This is the whole notion of the constructivist perspective. And so we need to understand that as part of uh, the insight focus therapy process. The other aspect is that um, is that people are um, people. The first sta- people develop over time, and the first stage of development, and the second stages of development are the, are the most important in terms of the construction of the mind. And that when people go through attachment, and then the next stage of separation and exploration, these these aspects of development are vitally important in the way that. Uh, a child's mind is able to to form or or to be constricted in its formation. If, for example, we have a child who has um, the parents for, uh, are not available, and it could be a, a multitude of reasons why this would be so. For example, the the mother might be in hospital because she's sick, and the father might be at sea. Um, it's not always a pathological reason why they're not there, but nevertheless they're not there. A child will then be have a sense of abandonment and will not have a good sense of attachment. With this non-attachment um, occurs, uh, creates in the child a, a fear, a fearfulness, because they're essentially their needs are not being met. Now the child doesn't have the capacity to work that out. All they know is my needs are not being met and now I'm afraid. And it's this fear that actually creates a difficulty for the child who actually develop, the, for their minds to develop in a safe way so that they can pr- produce all of the, the necessary neurons that are needed for them to move to the next stage of development. So we can see then that early childhood development is a very important part of understanding humanity Um, and we need to understand that ourselves if we want to make changes in our lives. The next thing um, that is part of the process is is the fear factor Um, and that when people get afraid the thing that it is to be human is that when we get afraid we do something to protect ourselves. This is called the survival mechanism, fight and flight. And if we have a child who's growing up in an unsafe environment or it's a perceivedly unsafe environment, then the fight and flight factor is going to be triggered constantly. This also means that they're not going to develop very happily over time. This inhibits their learning and it prevents them from being able to see a wider perspective of what might be around them. In fact, their perspective is narrowed to the extent that they can probably only see the thing that's most fearful. And so this enhances uh, their fearful perspective of the world as they carry on and as they grow. This is a, um, a vitally important aspect for all of us to come to terms with because the way in which we live these days, we frequently trigger ourselves into a fight and flight response. And as we figure out, as we trigger ourselves into this fight and flight response, then it's virtually impossible for us to actually use all of our capacities because we're actually in fact shutting down as opposed to opening up. And so then the, uh, we, we become stuck in this um, process of um, having to do something that's scary, trying harder to do it and we can't because our capacities are shrinking. Then we try harder and we can't, our capacities are shrinking. Until finally we end up giving up or um, concluding that there must be something wrong with me. And then once that happens and a person is on a downward spiral into giving up and going back to the old perspectives that they had from early childhood. So another... Um, aspect of what we need then is to is to find a way to help people um, become um, kinder to themselves so that they can actually begin to dissipate this fear factor. Um, this is necessary in order for us to have an alternative experience to the fight and flight response. 
So fight and flight is a is a natural thing. We do it. It takes about five milliseconds for it to happen. So it's less than a... And we don't think about this. We just do it. It's a protective thing that all people do. And so when we get into situations that are threatening, um, which is virtually every many moments throughout the day, then we can see that we're actually losing capacities to function in a holistic way. We're actually restricting ourselves, becoming more and more restricted and um, losing our capacities to grow and develop. And so we go back to our old ways of being in order to go forward. Another factor that we need to talk about here is the whole concept of perceived reality. Um, our perceived reality is not always known to us. Um, we perceive certain things, but it, many times these things are out of awareness. Because they were learned, these things were learned in early childhood, we have, we, we store them, these beliefs, in, in what's called implicit memory. And implicit memory is simply um, memory that you don't remember. And that sounds like a very curious thing to say, but it's true to say that there are many memories that we have that are not stored in our head, but they're stored in other parts of our bodies. These implicit memories that have no story um, have an effect on us, but we don't know that they are having an effect on us. These are the things that, that threaten us. These are the things that get triggered through the day that cause us to go into fight and flight. For example... If we have an early attachment um, difficulty and in a child, the child has abandonment issues and then um, gets married uh, to a sailor and then the husband, who's the sailor, says, OK, darling, I'm off to sea now. And then all of a sudden, <gasps> there's this frightening response in the wife that her husband is now about to embark on a journey of out to sea. He looks at her and says, you know, it's okay, I'm only going to sea, I'll be back soon. And she goes, yes, I know. <gasps> and she can't figure out why she's having such a reaction, but she is. And it's because she has an early childhood memory that's implicit. She can't remember that it's there, but it is there. And it's causing a reaction in her in her everyday life. But she doesn't know that it is. She knows that it's causing a reaction, but she doesn't know what it is. And so this brings us to the next important factor, which is uh, the whole concept of awareness, that we need to become aware of the things that are out of awareness. So these implicit memories that come from early childhood need to come into focus. But how can we know what we don't know? How can we become aware of things that we aren't aware of? If you don't know, you don't know that you don't know. And if you don't know, you don't know, you don't know that you need to go looking for them. There's a lot of don't knows in there. And yet you do know that there's something happening in your life that you don't like. And what most of us do is we try to go on a search back, you know, a logical search. I guess many of you have done that before, trying to work out why am I like this? Why am I like this? But the unfortunate thing is that when we go on a search backwards to find out why we're like this, we're actually trying to follow a cognitive trail. And when we try to find a cognitive, follow a cognitive trail, we don't get anywhere important because this implicit memory doesn't have a cognitive link. It's something that we experience well before we're able to think. So this really is a significant um, necessity for us to understand that if we have something in this in this day in in our daily life and we and it's having an impact on us and we want to figure out what that is but we can't and we try to go on a journey to, to back to our through our cognitive understanding and we can't find the link then we will conclude again that there must be something wrong with me and then we're most inclined to give up and get depressed I'm sure many of you can uh, have experiences of this kind. Um, my life certainly was full of these kinds of experiences. So frustrating because the harder you try, the worse it seems to get. And so um, it was uh, 
it's been vitally important for for me to find a way through all of this and I think that this whole concept of awareness and going um, following uh, going back in time to find an unknown known an unknown knowing that is out of cognitive awareness um, and bring it up into the present moment and and bring it up onto the screen of our consciousness so that we can understand more about why we do what we do. So the, there's awareness then is an important factor in insight focused therapy. But awareness is, is only one thing. Um, it's, it, what's also important is the kind of awareness that we have. So awareness is is okay, but if you if you become aware of something and then you go, oh, oh no, I don't want that awareness, then immediately you're triggering fight and flight again. And of course, once you get fight and flight, you're getting a narrowing of capacities. And once your capacities narrow, then you have to go back to the old system, an old logic to try and work out how to go forward. And this is what creates um, patterns of behavior. If you ever had a pattern of behavior, you go see yourself going around and around and around like this over and over. I have, and this was one of the things that originally got me into counseling in the first place, is like something needs to happen in my life because I just keep on repeating these things. And as I said before, if you can't find a solution, you have to blame yourself. And once you blame yourself, you become you can become deeply depressed because what can you do about who you are? If who you are equals this, then what hope is there? And even even to pray and to um, and to fast and to do these spiritual things didn't seem to help me to get over uh, these kind of stuck, repetitive patterns. And so it was clear that we needed more. We needed to understand what was happening deep inside us. Another factor that's important here in the insight focus therapy is is the the way in which we are aware, and we call this um, this way of being mindfulness. Mindfulness is really a very old term, but it is it's been recently researched by the neuroscientists and been found to be highly effective in bringing about neurological change. And neurological change is what makes the difference to our sense of well-being in the end because it's the early perceived ideas, which we call mental states, that produce emotional states that lead to behavioral traits that lead us to do the things that we do over and over. And so if we can bring about a change in these neurological states through the concept of um, neurological change, which comes through mindfulness, then this is a very powerful thing to as, as a tool to add to our therapy sessions. So mindfulness is a way of being in the present moment without connecting to the past and without connecting to the future. It's about being here, here and now, and being here and now in this moment. And when we're here and now in this moment, we need to be here in a certain kind of way. And that is um, curious and open and accepting and loving and kind without judging. And all of these factors are highly important for us so that we can create an environment of love. And it's love and with love we have the dissipation of fear. And when we get rid of fear then we're not getting the fight and flight response that narrows our capacities and takes us back to the past. So the being in the present moment in a way of kindness and curiosity and openness and acceptance is powerfully important for us in order to begin to expand our awarenesses rather than to diminish our awarenesses. Expanding our awarenesses then allows us to be, become open to uh, new ideas, new concepts, new per perceptions. Maybe the truth about who we are rather than the belief about who we are. The truth about who we are, the truth about who we are in the eyes of God, the truth about 
who we are, even in our own eyes, as we can begin to see something more than what we've been given in the past. So mindfulness. Mindfulness is a powerful tool for being in the present moment and bringing about change. Well, it basically sets the scene in order for change to occur. And the reason that it does that is, is because it dissipates fear. So curiosity stops us from analyzing. And analyzing will take you back to the past, trying to follow logical links to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Openness. Openness is the opposite of being defended. Defended is protecting yourself from something that's harmful. And we, as soon as we begin to do that, then we begin the fight and flight process, narrow down our capacities and get stuck in our old ways of being. Openness is the opposite of being closed. Openness leads us into a place of curiosity and wonder. And it's in this place of curiosity and wonder that we begin to see new things. And it's this new data that comes into the system that allows us to have an alternative perspective. Not only uh, do we need curiosity and openness, but we also need acceptance. Because if we don't accept who we are or how we are in this moment, then we're judging. And most of the Western culture are fantastic at judging. We judge this, we judge that, we judge this. And we, and as soon as we start judging, then we've created a fight and flight response because there's threat attached to judgment. And the moment you get threat, you get fight and flight, and then you go back to the old way of being. So in order to stay in this moment, in order to become open and to become more aware of new data, new perceptions, we need to stop judging. We need to start accepting who we are and how we are. That something happened to us in our past that's caused us to be the way we are right now, but that doesn't make us stuck with the way we are. Because our perception may just need a little bit of a change. And we can get a new perception if we set the scene well enough to be able to do so. And I call it the difference between surviving and thriving. In the, in the fight and flight response in daily life, we're, all we're doing is surviving. It's just a survival mechanism. We survive with what we've got, but we never thrive. And if you think about um, what we want to do for our children, what we want to do for our animals, for anything that you love, you want them to thrive and not just survive. And surely this must be true for ourselves as well, that if we provide the right kind of environment, then we as people can begin to thrive, absolutely thrive. And isn't that what Jesus came to teach us to, teach us to do, or what he came to help us to do, to, to proclaim liberty to the captives and, and to set us free and to make us whole and to give us uh, joy instead of the garment of um, grief and, and misery, so that we be oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that God might be glorified, glorified in our greatness, not in our miserableness. And this gives us an opportunity to, to actually begin to achieve this without a whole lot of hard work. And so mindfulness is a, is a place or a space in the present moment where you're curious, open, accepting how you are and who you are, and also loving and kind. And that it's vitally important that we love ourselves. And it certainly is one of the commandments of Jesus. You love God, love yourself, and love others. It's important to love what God loves. But not only that, there's a scientific rationale wrapped around all of this. And that is uh, Stephen Porges' theory, polyvagal theory, that is to do with um, in the if you can dissipate fear, then love will be present. And he calls the theory love without fear. It's an interesting title, isn't it? Love without fear. That if we can, if we can get rid of fear, then we're going to have love. And so if we want to dissipate fear in the moment, we need to introduce love. Loving kindness to ourselves as much as we can and as well as we're able to be kind to ourselves. And then... 
what begins to happen uh, as we provide this kind of environment is that we begin to broaden our awarenesses. So as I said to you before, um, the things that we don't know that we don't know begin to emerge on the screen of our consciousness. We begin to see things that we never saw before. And uh, it just reminds me of um, of the scripture in Ephesians 1.17 where it says, I pray, uh, Paul prayed for the Ephesians that the eyes of their hearts would be flooded with light. Not the eyes of their head, but the eyes of their hearts would be flooded with light so that they would see the secrets and the and the re- have the revelations of God. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, it also talks about that we have the mind of Christ, um, that God has given us uh, the, the given us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand the mind of God. So the thoughts and and uh, um, uh, imaginings that God has for us are actually available to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that when we can stay in this present moment, in this kind and open and curious and accepting way, then we can begin to to receive the power of the Holy Spirit into this space as well. And as we do that, we're creating an alternative perspective. An alternative perspective of who we are and how we are based on um, the image or the imaging that God gives us. This is a powerful thing. It is a, a, a truly powerful thing. When people begin to see themselves through the eyes of God, they begin to see something that they haven't seen before. They begin to see the graciousness of God, the kindness of God, um, the closeness of God, the, the um, always present Holy Spirit. And these things are powerful are powerful in, uh, in terms of um, changing the way our mental states are formed. And once that begins to happen, then there's a neurological change in our brains. And when we begin to get new data coming into the system, the old system can't stay the same. It has to change. It's like the pattern in a kaleidoscope. It just, it changes. All of the pieces are, are perhaps still the same, but because it's in a different configuration, you have now have a different perspective. You have a new insight. And from this new insight comes a new mental state, a new emotional state, and then new behaviors that then lead to a better way of living. So incorporated into that is the concept that we that it's called um, is taken from coherence therapy, and that is that everything that we do in this present moment is related to something from our past, even if we don't know that it is. So we need to take the thing that we have, uh, that we see, the thing that we're doing that we don't like even, we need to take that and follow that, or t- we need to bless it and to accept it rather than to push it away. We need to bless it and accept it and follow that trail back to, um, or back to where it takes us. And then as we do that, we have new awarenesses emerging on the screen of our consciousness. As these new awarenesses, Awarenesses emerge in the present moment in a kind, curious, open and accepting way. And we're open to the Spirit of God as well. Then we begin to see some powerful new revelations. And it's these powerful revelations that make, as I said before, that make the change in our mental structures. These changes in mental structures um, can occur very, very quickly, extremely quickly and without a great degree of of stress and strain and 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 from this um, um, begins to emerge new knowings about life new um, new visions new new sight new smells new awarenesses it's all it's like you're coming to life it's like um, you're waking up to seeing the world uh, in a new way and as you do that then the old fear and the old ways of uh, condemning yourself um, seem to just uh, dissolve away and you're stepping into what um, uh, what we would have to call abundant life or the Christian would call that abundant life um, other the scientists would probably say that we enter into a greater sense of well-being but either way 
um, it's it's a greater sense of well-being, a greater sense of of um, acceptance with who you are, um, a better perspective of going for going forward, a better way of living your daily life. Um, it's creative, has more energy, um, it's more generous, um, it's more loving and forgiving, and um, all sorts of um, amazing and creative ideas can begin to emerge from within you. And I think it's, um, it's what uh, Thomas Keating said, that we, when we fall back into this, uh, when we're in this place of mindfulness, it's like we fall back into ourselves and we meet with the image of God in us. And as we do that, then we get in touch with the DNA, our potentiality. And then it's out of this um, DNA, this potentiality, that, um, that genius ideas begin to flow. And I truly believe that we haven't seen, uh, we haven't seen anything yet in terms of what human beings are capable of. We have seen what human beings are capable of in a bad way. But we haven't really seen what human beings are capable of when we can get back in touch with this um, creative potentiality that, that, that comes alive in this present moment and is specifically when it's in, incorporated into the, the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. It's an awesome thing to watch people's lives change and to see them move out of um, crippling, fearful-based lives into generous generosity, emergent living, um, and imagine that that if the if the whole world could be filled with people who um, were generous and kind and uh, forgiving and loving and non-judging and accepting and looking for the good and looking for the gold and and looking for the image of God and everybody that they meet. Um, imagine what kind of world we would be living in. It would be fantastic. It would just be awesome. And that is the, um, I guess, the heart and the essence uh, of my um, passion behind promoting IFT. To see, to see this kind of um, th this kind of experience happen in the lives of hundreds and thousands of people all around the world. And. Um, when you think about uh, the possibilities, it, it, aren't we just talking simply about living in the fruits of the Spirit? Isn't this what Paul talks about in, in Corinthians 13 when he, when he speaks of, um, of the fruits of the Spirit, you know, that we are generous and kind and forgiving and, and patient and so on? And this uh, is a, um, IFT, the, the integration of these scientific theories is a um, is a, a perfect parallel to what um, Jesus was talking about when he was um, when he was um, asking us to um, to walk in his ways and to do what we saw him doing because he said that he was only doing what he saw the father doing so if we were doing what he was doing we were doing what the father was doing and that was to walk in the way of Christ. And that when we, when he, when he, um, had, when he talked to the his disciples about his imminent leaving, he he also said, "Look, it's better that I go away. Much better that I go away, so that the Father can send the Holy Spirit to you, so that the Holy Spirit can dwell within you. And when the Holy Spirit dwells within you, then you have all of this capacity inside of you. And you know, I think the only thing that keeps us." from actually living in the spirit is fear. And so therefore if we can have, and, and that fear comes from our perceptions of ourself, others, God and the world, based on how we, how, how we were constructed in our early lives, in our early years. So if we can have a, 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 um, a method or a way of working with ourselves, it's really a way of life, a way of living, that allows us to, for this fear to dissipate and for us to see more and more about the truth about who we really are, then we can begin to live in the absence of fear and in the presence of love. And then it's in this state that we can begin to really accomplish great things. And 
mean, even if we don't want to accomplish great things, we can become um, uh, fabulous human beings who are able to really enjoy the love that God has sent to the earth when he sent Jesus to save us. Nu har vi hört uh, Pauline, kan Pauline fortalt om hur uh, 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 det IFT, hur det bröder människor. Jag har kan fortala att jag har om att jag var i terapi med Pauline och det var 2003. Och jag har framman undan att jag har varit i Afrika och jag har varit något som har varit där som jag var rädd stor. Det var något som har varit som jag gjorde och och jag har arbetat i kyrkan så arbetade vi inte samman om det arbete som var. Men det kom inte förr så föll det lika som att det var bara en månad att göra tingen på. Och här är arbetet så vi och i terapi. Och den här terapin ändå vi tog att jag och Pauline stod uppe och jag och stod en hetsen i kallting. Vi har en flatsk och jag har fått sig visionen om att byta att uh, att nu det till att kunna vara vara här som vi tar till terapi och vi tar till salarökt. Du tar väl låma vissla gästa det vi salarökt. Och det är också att jag nämnde här att att lampa är också något som sövan till AFT bär från att vi först för att möta Polin och så till idag kan vi 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 det här var en också som är det grekvande lampa och kan först kunna komma till salarökt. Och det är det som är alltså är så fantastiskt störst. Och att den öften som är hej i några år, en fyra kunde göra det här. Det är den samma öften som Pauline nu har tagit sig om. Att det här har varit tydligt väck och något annat kommer in i stegen. Så det är att, att god vyrsla för arbete och hela jante för att lära arbetet. Och, och att den öften man flyttar för, för hela jante. Och det, det är det här som är allt det här är så fantastiskt störst. Att vi får löjligt till att leva utifrån oss. Så allt det här som, som, har, som har bont med oss nu från man inte har kört om jag behöver kalla feminister och har varit ganska en uppröst på den här mata och har blivit satt som en som, som är ganska uppemot autoriteten. Och det är ju nog oss nu, men alltså det är oss nu det är det här som jag har i bagagen från min, min bebattna ungdomsåren. Och det här kommer här till som jag gör det att ta en öster när jag tycker att det är inte så fantastiskt. Jag har varit i Afrika och jag har Slashes and whatever it is you 